Hi, my name is Bernadette Brown. I'm with the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, and I oversee an initiative on lesbian, gay, bisexual, questioning, and transgender youth in um, the juvenile justice system here in California. And we also do national training. So one of the things I wanted to highlight is the importance of asking questions about sexual orientation and gender identity and gender expression on any type of intake forms and risk assessments. We, we don't see it happening very much, and as it's already been discussed up here, there are, there are certain things on some forms and, and not on other forms. But lesbian, bisexual, and questioning girls are actually twice as likely to be detained for prostitution as compared to straight girls. And gay, bisexual, and questioning boys are ten times as likely to be detained for prostitution. So it's important to ask these questions, one, because your service providers need to know who they're serving and provide the appropriate services to these kids. And two, there's a federal law called the Prison Rape Elimination Act, and that governs the federal institutions for juveniles and adults throughout the country. And it requires a, a list of things, of risk factors to take into consideration when protecting inmates and juvenile residents from sexual abuse. Two of those things are, one, a prior history of sexual abuse. So if you have a CSEC kid and you're detaining them, and I really hope that we all are in the same position with Detention is not the answer, and we don't really want these kids in detention. So I'm grateful to T for saying detention does not equal prevention. But when you are detaining them, they're already coming in with the risk factor is that they've already been sexually abused. And then lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and intersex, Priya uses intersex, um, they are also at greater risk of being sexually abused. So it's important that detention facilities have on their intake forms questions about sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression so that you can provide the proper protections. And we don't see, see that happening very much. So it's very important. LGB, LGB kids are seven times greater to be sexually abused by other youth when they are in detention. So when we say detention is safer, det detention is safer when you've already been sexually abused and if you are a lesbian, gay, or bisexual, you are actually also at great risk, tremendous risk from sexual abuse just by being in detention. And the other thing I wanted to mention about transgender girls and women, they are oftentimes arrested not just in California but in places like New York and, and in the South. Even if they're just, they're just walking down the street and they have condoms on them, they're being arrested and they are not seen as victims. So they're not even getting access to the services that cisgender girls, and by cisgender I mean your birth certificate says you are female and you identify as a female or a woman, so you're cisgender as opposed to transgender, in which case your birth certificate says you're a male, but you identify as a woman or a girl. They are not getting the same types of services. If you are a transgender girl, you are not really seen as a victim in a lot of places throughout the country. So I just wanted to highlight those concerns. Okay. Anybody want to comment? No? Okay, next. Wait, hold it. Where we go? Who's got it now? Kate's got yeah. it? Okay. Um, so, Aisha, you were saying that you make the reports, you're a mandated reporter, um, when it goes over to child welfare and it's determined that a third party is the exploiter and it's not occurring in the parent or guardian's home, what then happens? Because child welfare has been alerted that a child is being victimized. So I, I just, I'm curious what happens at that point. Are, is law enforcement getting involved? Because Aisha is sitting with a child that she knows has been victimized and is at further risk of being re-victimized. So I just don't know where the systems intersect and how that child gets help. Who would like to take that? Michelle? Oh, you don't have a mic. You'd like to take it, but you can't. In Alameda County, we cross-report to the appropriate law enforcement jurisdiction. And so are they then investigating that's our understanding. They're responsible. They have to respond to the cross report in the same vein that we would respond as appropriate. And can I ask one follow-up question to that? Sure. Is law enforcement officer? So then is the law enforcement officer making a, a, a judgment as to whether a home is a viable placement for a child? So they're just, they're just addressing the crime. But the child could then go back to the home, and that home may not may not be safe, right? So if they view the home isn't safe, then they would actually cross-report. At risk, they leave the home. The home is still safe. Well, so, so sometimes the home may not be safe, though, too. Yeah. Yeah.
So, I mean, I, I think that Kate is identifying a gap in our systems. Um, and, the, you know, we, we, I think we've touched on it, but we were talking on the break, um, you know, Jennifer and I, bottom line, if a 15-year-old, 14-year-old person has STDs or is being sexually abused, there's a problem. So even though the home may not meet petition filing standards from a child welfare perspective or from a law enforcement perspective, we have a big gap in our system is in that, you know, to the point where those young people are not being protected. And that's the $64,000 question is what do we do? And that's what the legislation is hoping to address and other things are hoping to address. But law enforcement tells us all the time that they find themselves in a situation where they will have a youth sitting in the police car they want to help her and they are told no by child welfare. They don't want to necessarily have her be incarcerated, but they feel they have no choice. So they go to, um, they arrest her because they realize that bringing her home is not an option, even though the home meets a baseline standard of quote unquote safety in the home. So it's a, it's a problem. I, I think, um, you're raising a really good question because after this child, and we're talking about the child, has been reported on and there was no evidence to remove that child, now that child has to go home to where she was reported on and uh, basically answer to you have, uh, quote unquote, these white people in my life, okay? And that puts the child at danger in itself, and it uh, kind of starts the repeat process of the child leaving the home, going back to the exploiter where she feels safest. So uh, in this gap in the system, um, as T uh, uh, expressed, there has to be a way in, in knowing how to articulate what is a danger to uh, Child Protective Services to where something can be done uh, as opposed to it being a false call and putting the, the child in more danger. And I'll just say really quickly, because we could go on and on about this. In Alameda County, when law enforcement perceives that there's any danger to a child, they remove. And I don't think a lot of people realize in Alameda County, 70% of all children that come into foster care do not come into foster care from child welfare. They come into foster care from law enforcement. And that has been consistent because every month we have to read how the children came in. 65% is the minimum, but 70% of all kids that come into care in Alameda County do come in from law enforcement. So if a beat officer is out, and sometimes it's just I don't have the energy to deal with it, there's a little mess here and I'm worried, they'll bring the kids into care. I think it's easy not to, if you don't understand those numbers. So I, I haven't met too many police officers yet, and there are, I'm sure there are some. Not saying anything bad about law enforcement. But if there is a concern when they get out to the home after we've cross-reported, it's easier for them just to bring the kids into care. And that literally is what happens in our county. So just one last comment. As a mandated reporter, so the issue that you know, mandated reporters uh, face is that we're reporting, we're, we're doing our duty of reporting an abuse that this person has just stated. I'm doing my duty to call social services. Um, off bat, I don't give identifying information because I have to give the screening to see if it's something that's um, reportable or is something within the home. The majority of the time, because it's an exploiter, it's a third person, they're like, no, we can't take it because it's a third person. Um, you will have to um, give that information to the police. So then I am left with making the decision of having to report to the police or not. Because then I'm putting her, the child, in another predicament because if I do report it, then they will have to come and question her about this abuse. Um, that, and then it may lead on to a prosec you know, prosecuting an exploiter or whoever it may be, and that's not something that she wants. So definitely I'm left with making the decision of like, well, I did my duty of mandate and reporting. You know, they're saying they can't take it. It has to be cross-reported. So that's where I'm also debating on, you know, that piece because of the fact that there is no, you know, really an appropriate 
response because of the fact that it's a third person. It's not a family. I think, you know, based on the fact of the lack of funding and the lack of, you know, support that social services has of, you know, developing maybe another tool or screening or how do we move on to like keep it in the radar? Because my concern is this, that's the radar piece. I'm reporting this child and this child is just getting lost in the many calls I'm making. And it's like, oh, she's in our system. Yeah, I made about five CPSs report on her. You know, but definitely I think it's just improving the way, you know, that we create. I think as we move forward is one of the things that we will need to improve in regards to capturing the, you know, the risk of that person. Okay, we have a question. Oh, we got lots of this lady right here who's been waiting for like a, a week and a half. What, what now? Okay, okay, so we got I was wondering if there's been any consideration to taking the girls' court model and moving it to dependency, so you'd have a you know a consistent judge and an especially trained county counsel and especially trained minors counsel and advocates in the courtroom, but that it's happening through the dependency system and not the delinquency. Santa Clara does that. Santa Clara County has had a girls' court for a long time in, on the dependency side. It's a model that people like, but I don't know of anyone else that has it. Right, and my, but my understanding is that Santa Clara, I mean, they don't, they don't arrest or detain at all, right? So our girls' court is not only for C-sex, but also for girls at risk. So many of our girls, right, and then those who are escalating in terms of their delinquency. So we're not only dealing with C-sex, but we're dealing with girls that come in for other offenses. So they have to be dealt with on the delinquency side, but there's definitely either a history in the past that maybe they weren't charged with or there are risk factors. So I'm not sure if it would ever be an appropriate model here. I don't know. I, you know, perhaps we could do that. I mean, we, we, we've been doing this since June of 2011. Uh, we still are trying to work out the kinks in terms of our girls' court. Um, we still have a lot of work to do. I mean, just some of the problems and issues that we talked about. But certainly, you know, one of the, one of the things that I think is positive is that it seems that we have a situation, an alignment of the stars, if you will, where we actually have people on a num in a number of different areas, uh, social, social services, probation, behavioral health, you know, many of our community partners, uh, where there is an openness to talking about how we do this better. And so um, that's certainly something that we, we could think about. Great. Hannah, who we have next? Oh, right here. Hi, I'm Camille Cyrus with the Alameda County Office of Education. I'm one of the caseworkers there. I'm working primarily with the foster youth services. And in that program, there are a ton of resources. A lot of you guys are in the room. However, previously, I was a crisis intervention counselor in the community-based um, organization, and we had a lot of families who were, um, who had children who were just truant. They were just 600, 601s and they, they weren't getting the resources that they needed for their children. So the families who are going out with the papers looking for their, their girls who are on the street, the police will find them, they'll bring them to our office. We were the first point of contact, but yet we couldn't give families any information and resources for their youth. Um, and in fact, to help them with their children who are ex uh, exploited. And in fact, a lot of the times they would be told um, after a certain number of times, if you're reporting your child as a runaway and missing, they're going to start um, finding them as parents. So where are the resources for those parents who have the truancy kids, opposed to the ones who are now in the system, whether it's dependency or court? Um, and if we're talking about a culture change, how can we start there with those families? Because um, there, there is a lot, and especially when you can't report a child who's um, as kidnapped. I've had several parents that way because then their pimps have make the child call after so many hours every other day. So they can't report them missing because the child have in fact contacted the household. And so I saw a lot of that going on. Okay, Judge? <clears throat> well, I, I guess I can speak to the truancy yeah. court. I, I do uh, preside over our truancy court. Huge issues in terms of resources uh, for our truancy court. I mean, that's the biggest problem, I think, in terms of, uh, of, of providing services that are really going to be helpful to families because what I find and I don't know if this really I, that you had kind of two parts to your question and maybe Jennifer can address the second part but the in, in terms of the truancy what I find is that the truant behavior is just like the tip of the iceberg you know that's just one symptom that happens as a result of all this other stuff that's going on within a family you know and so the things that I see are a lot of you know un um, 
undiagnosed, untreated uh, mental health issues, <laughs> depression, uh, extreme poverty. Uh, those are the issues that I see in the truancy court in terms of, um, and just the engagement, um, a lot of isolation of these families, uh, you know, isolation from everybody, really. You know, so they're not getting any services, they're not getting any help, and people are coming in and trying to do s stuff or as assist them, uh, first off, and, you know, with the SARBs and the educational system, but it's really just not an understanding of what the family needs and not a real uh, dialogue with the family to engage them about what they need, actually listening to their voice. The first time that we started to have make some inroads and we still have a long way to go, but the only thing that has, that has given us some source of hope on my every other Friday truancy court is uh, wraparound services. We've got some wraparound services where we actually have people who are connecting with the family in a real beneficial way. So um, I don't know, the whole issue of truancy, that's a huge, huge issue in and of itself. And the biggest problem there is the lack of real resources to provide families with the services that they need on a number of different levels. So our office has actually provided services to parents when I'm alerted by someone in my office. There's, there's someone who handles truancy at the Juvenile Justice Center and then someone who handles it at, at another courthouse. And I have gotten phone calls from that other prosecutor and I have been able to provide resources. Another situation happened where um, it came to my attention. Interestingly enough, it was Saturday night at about 8 o'clock, and I got a call from one of the public defenders who told me that he was concerned about something that his client told him. She was in custody. I think she'd been picked up on Friday. I immediately called Pat. We all have each other's cell phones, so we harass each other. Um, I called Pat, and by Monday, I think Monday afternoon, you guys saw her. Um, and I don't know if the, if the parents were talked to or just the young lady, but anytime anything is brought to my attention, it can be mentioned in safety net. Again, it can come from truancy or the delinquency system or the dependency system. So if I'm aware of it, I'm more than happy to coordinate services or at least pass the information on to an advocate who can then try to engage with the family. Thank you. Yes. So as a mental health professional, we all know that when we keep the focus on the youth where it needs to be, there's a lot of trauma that goes on and, um, and how the trauma really affects them and their families and all of us who work with them. And we're very fortunate today to have a mental health consultant and expert here from Washington, D.C., Bonnie Martin. And I wanted to ask Barney, Bonnie, what's missing from this conversation? What aren't we talking about? So here we go. <laughs> Wow, this, that's a little uncomfortable. Um, what, here's, I will just say, just so it's such an honor to be here and an amazing, amazing work that you guys are doing. Um, there are, I, I can already tell I do this internationally and domestically, and you guys are in the forefront of this work here, which is just so encouraging for me. Um, what's missing? Um, we've heard a lot about my specialty is how, and we've heard a lot about what we need to be doing. Um, we need to have a different lens, we need to stop labeling, we need to see uh, these young people's victims, we need to work with children where they are. So that's all the what, we all know what we need to be doing. And so what I specialize in is how we do that. And what I've heard kind of missing, what I would love to hear uh, in the future for all conversations like this is um, first of all, uh, that we as professionals use more professional language and that we're educated with evidence-based practices and trauma-informed care. So, write it down. The ver very first thing we need to be incorporating in this language is the stages of change. So that we look at, instead of saying, oh, well, she ran, we say, well, you know, I've got a girl on the street and she's in the pre-contemplation stage. <laughs> I'm going to call CPS. What stage is she in? Oh, well, she's contemplating, or she's in the preparation stage. Every single one of us should be using that professional language, because without it, we're floundering. We're, we're still labeling, kind of. You've kind of heard it here, and we're, we're not speaking in a professional language about the young person we have in front of us. Even with the judge, it's like, well, you know, she's, she's in the pre-contemplation stage. She's not ready. And that takes it out of this really weird kind of language. So anyway, five stages of change, Google it. You can find it everywhere because it's evidence-based uh, trauma-informed protocol. 
Okay, so that's one thing that, that I think it's so helpful for every part of the system to be using that language. It's just a one sentence. I get you on the phone, what stage is she in? I need placement, I need housing, what stage is she in? And every single person in the system uses the stages of change. Okay, so the second thing that, um, that we need, uh, and I have an acronym that I use, it's called SERVE. So it's how we serve uh, these clients, these particular clients. This model is based for this population. It's years and years of field experience and research and diving to silos all over the place. Um, and, and so the acronym is the first thing we need to be doing is symptom normalization. Every behavior that I see in this child is a normal reaction to abnormal stress. So I'm going to normalize this. The, these, this running behavior, the cutting, the, uh, the addictions, um, the anger, the outburst, all of the, everything I'm seeing is a very normal reaction to abnormal stress. So symptom normalization. And I do that for my kids. I'm like, you know what? I get them in the car. I'm like, your heart pounding? You're ready to run, aren't you? You're going to want to run. Like, I mean, it's just normalizing it. It's like, I take them out to a field, cornfield, with a beautiful home, with a zen garden. First thing I'm going to say to them is, you're going to have a hard time sleeping tonight, maybe. So let's talk about how awful it's going to feel to be in this Taj Mahal when you've been living in a flea-bitten motel, drinking Mountain Dew and eating Snickers every day. Like, it's a shock to the system. So I normalize it for the kids. Okay, so the second part of the serve is educating about the brain's stress response. And so what I would love to hear in this conversation from professionals is fight or flight and dissociation. Judge, my client's dissociating, I need a minute. Law enforcement, adrenaline's pumping, I can see it. And being able to know the signs of fight or flight and dissociation, it should be part of our daily conversation. And being able to see when a kid dis dysregulates and to know how to help them with their dysregulation. And so that's the third part, regulation of the stress response, because they can't do it. They've never been taught how to regulate that stress response. We learn how to regulate our stress response through our primary caregiver's ability to teach us. So if I was never taught how to regulate my stress response, I don't know how. So as a caseworker, as law enforcement, um, I, I'm constantly helping my clients with, deep, with the breathing, with the sour candy, with the drink of water. I might say, you know, when she has to testify, look, if I see the, the symptoms of hyperarousal, how to regulate that quickly, when to step back, when to give them space and time. But if I don't understand that whole world, if I don't understand the symptoms of uh, trauma triggers, if I don't use the language, my client's being triggered right now, right? If I'm not using the proper language, and all I'm left with is, well, she's freaking out. Well, she ran again. Well, and I'm using this language that still is inappropriate. You know, so it, um, the next part is the V in serve. So we have symptom normalization, education about the brain, uh, and the stress response. And I teach my clients all of it too, so that we all have the same language, and regulation of their stress response. And then the V is validation of anger and grief. And you know, you've heard. We know where we want our clients to be, and we talk about, you know, we, we want them to sit, they have time to sit with themselves, and we're using prefrontal cortex language. We want them to unpack their, and not understanding the brain, that, the, that trauma, teenagers, and, and addiction all strengthen the limbic part of the brain. So I'm literally looking at a child whose brain is incapable of doing what I want them to do. And part of this process is understanding that their grief and their anger right now is not at their pen. It's at me. <laughs> I, you know, the anger and the grief can be misplaced. And until I can get that prefrontal cortex online, until I can get that prefrontal cortex connectivity, until I can get them out of survival mode and that brain can even begin to operate with moral judgment and delayed gratification and, you know, reasoning. I, I'm expecting somebody who is disabled, like physically in a wheelchair, to do something they cannot do. So the validation of the anger and grief at first is not where I think it should be. But, it, but I still need to validate it. They're going to be grieving. Maybe if, once you, we pick them up, they have siblings they're not providing for anymore. 
We put them in a placement, but guess where their mom's sleeping? Under the bridge. There's all this guilt um, and, and shame. And then there's anger. And it's not always where we want it to be, but if I validate that grief and anger, over time, I can help them with the real grief and anger. And they can't, you know, feeling the anger and the grief, we, we often hear people say, that, and it's true, that they don't self-identify as victims. And there's a really good reason for that. Um, because once I accept that I'm a victim, many of my clients, their every strength system that they've placed to survive falls apart. And it is the, huge. So being a, once they say I'm a victim, that's when the real mental health issues <laughs> rise because they've spent their whole uh, existence having to believe they have empowerment and a choice. And when I take that away from them. They're, they're in a, they're, their whole framework has just collapsed and they have to accept. That, that victim role is so hard for them to accept. And the more angry they are when you work with them, the more difficult that victimization role is gonna be for them to say. And the last part of the serve model is empowerment. And um, you know, they're abusers, they're exploiters, they've taken absolute control and power. And sometimes, you know, we want to just take control and power over them and be like, you don't, you don't need to be there, you don't need to go with them, you don't need to walk that street, you don't need to do this. Uh, the, the three messages of abuse are always don't think, don't feel, don't speak. And I don't want to be that person in their life because I'm no different than their exploiter or their pimp. So in the small ways, I need to empower them. And, you know, at first, very small things like, you know, would you like orange juice or apple juice? V very small ways, but always honoring their autonomy and honoring the strengths that have gotten them to where they are because the fact that they're still alive is amazing. I don't want to cut you off, but I'm going to cut okay. you off. No, that's okay. Thanks. <laughs> Very good. And then we have this. And then our last question is coming from right here. Over there. Not me. Right. Not you. Okay. You're okay. the next to last. Um, I'm Amy Price with the Zellerbeck Family Foundation and um, have uh, two questions and I, I also just wanted to, to um, share something which is that um, we talked about addressing demand which hasn't really been addressed much here and, and, and prevention piece and um, the SAGE project, we just gave a small grant to the SAGE project to develop a curriculum for boys, um, middle school age boys to address both them as victims as well as the exploiters as well as exploiting and um, trying to raise that issue and, and start there. And so that sort of leads to my first question, which is, um, and maybe this is much bigger, I know this is much bigger than sort of what's in this room right now or, or the, the focus, but um, we know that a majority of kids who end up um, exploited come from or have had some touch with the child welfare system. And um, we're looking at, well, what happens once they've been exploited? And my question is, well, what are we doing to prevent the exploitation to begin with? And how can we change the system to, um, you know, particularly kids who are identified as uh, sexually abused, which we know gives them a greater chance of becoming um, exploited and or exploiters. And the one study that I've seen of um, pimps and exploiters suggests that they have the same backgrounds. And so I think if we can look at um, better prevention and, and providing more effective services, and that's the part that's, of course, much bigger than, than what's in this room right now, then I think we can address both sides of that. Um, and my, my second question is, um, Leslie brought up, suggested that everybody should have um, access to somebody 24-7. And my question is, what are we doing? You know, we're looking at symptoms and, or um, systems and resources which are always going to be limited. And my question is, what are we doing to connect kids to um, resources in the community, the informal resources, finding, you know, every story that I've heard from every child that's gone through the child welfare system or who's been exploited always identifies at least one person who cared about them. And it might be a professional. It might be somebody um, who they had a professional relationship with. It might not have been. And so my question is, what are we doing to expand the network and, and look at people outside of the system and outside of paid people um, who can be there as resources for these kids? I'm not sure that I could respond to what are we doing. Um, but one of the things that we could easily be doing that we're not, and it's proven and it has nothing, it, was, it didn't start as a CSEC strategy, but family finding works. 
And it's this, it's a simple, extremely inexpensive way to connect youth to that one person who cares and who will be with them forever. Um, because generally it's someone known to them or their family. And we rarely, I mean, we use it in such a small percentage of cases. Um, and it's often at the back end instead of at the front end. If we did it at the front end, then we might never get to the point of the exploitation. So I think it would actually address um, almost everything that you, or many of the things that you just raised. Um, so that would be my one, you know, thing we could think about as a system that we already know how to do and that we have great success with, but we don't employ it universally and we don't think of it as a CSEC strategy, I don't think. And a thing that comes, comes to mind mostly on the last issue that you were talking about, although admittedly it's all related, is Safe Place, which is um, a national um, program, if you will, that's adopted in a number of different places, Seattle being one of them, um, and it, it has expanded actually to the full of King County. And it's it's a 24-7, it's a number to call. Uh, you train bus drivers, you train librarians, you train uh, McDonald's workers, everybody, um, so that a kid can see a sign that says this, or a billboard, Clear Channel, I know, for example, is donated. The business community has really gotten into this in a, in a big way about just making sure that there is, as in as many places you could possibly get it, a place for a child who is who is homeless, who is on the run, or who is maybe even on the track, but who is looking up at that and thinking, hmm, you know, maybe when uh, the light bulb would go on, or or some sense would would spark that maybe this is what I ought to do, and you can go up to in those places and you know it's safe you're going to be taken care of you're going to be um, you're going to be given someone to come and help you and try to figure out um, where you where you can go and be safe and and ultimately get some services I mean it's all meshed together um, in Alameda County we've had a focus on uh, permanent connections for youth for a number of years and it depends on the youth we've employed family to fa uh, family finding and engagement for a number of years um, front end, back end, it's a little different, difficult family finding in the front end because when children first come in the door, there are more people. Family is there. Every, you'd be surprised how many placements you can get on the front end. But what we've recently <coughs> launched is uh, permanency roundtables. Um, it's a tool used by the Casey Family Program to really focus on how do we redefine permanency for everyone and really focus on getting permanency more quickly, especially for the cases that have stalled. So we're hoping that'll fill in the gaps where family finding has left some vacancies um, to really move kids out of the system and back to a permanent connection in person. Oh, it's on. Here. Okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, just respond to that. And in addition to family finding, what I find is really useful is also um, nerf from home. So non-related kin pretty much. So the play aunts, the play uncles, you know, really utilizing that because that's the, the young people's core sense of, of community and really being able to reach out to that and have that support. Um, and then just really, really going back to uh, what you said, even more about the community connections and what we're doing. I, I, I as a survivor and something that I really advocately, advocate, advocate about is um, community connections. I would have never, ever been able to get anywhere in my life if I didn't really learn um, how to have connections outside of systems, specifically because I was a young person who was raised in a system. Um, and so just understanding and acknowledging your point to the community connections really does make change. And then going uh, in addition to that, Bonnie's point, the end point of empowerment, um, understanding that survivors will not heal um, there is not going to be any change or transformation in their life until they're empowered to know that they can be or do some be and, and do things differently than they ever knew before. Um, and so, and then I just wanted to make some final remarks in regards to um, the the way we talk about again the labeling, even in regards to the we refer to the customers as Johns and Janes, whatever language we use, we're still not really getting to the core of these are customers of child sex, and really um, so shifting the language and 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 stop utilizing these terms that make it seem okay and make it seem like the regular everyday, everyday Joe. It's oh it's okay you're a John um, because this is not okay. Um, and, and it's not a trick. And then just um, some points earlier, motel trainings, I think those things are amazing. The sad parts about it is, is that there's some motels that don't report because they're scared of loss of business. And then I know we talked about Department of Transportation earlier, but there's an amazing organization. And I just want to give big up for men who stand against this issue um, because 
a lot of the young people who are victimized um, don't have positive male role models. And so there's an awesome um, organization, Truckers Against Trafficking, as well. So. Let, let me, uh, I, I see Stacy standing up because, but we have one more question, and, I have, and we absolutely have to do it. And so um, if you don't mind holding on to your answers, let me get this last question. Hello. Um, I'm Theopia Jackson. I'm a psychologist at Children's Hospital Oakland, and it is quite apropos that my comment is coming last because I've been sitting here in the chair growingly dysregulated. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I appreciate everything that's been said today, and I love everything that's been said, and we began to tap into this, but what's missing for me is really centralizing that this is a symptom of a greater problem. What worries me is if we go down the track of looking for CSEC, then what else are we missing that's going on in other people's lives? We talked about our youth who identify anything other than um, heterosexual and what happens for them. I would like to see a culture shift of thinking about what is happening for children and their families, doing this with the families. That's what's been missing for me from this conversation, is that, they are, that these are symptoms of multi-generational unresolved trauma and multi-generational cultural traumas as well. So I would love to see our, um, each of our individual courts meeting together. So you, didn't, so you shouldn't have to say truancy doesn't have it over here and family doesn't have it over here. At what point do we start looking at the whole child within the whole family and working with them that way as opposed to entering in through these individual doors. Lastly, because what worries me is that we inadvertently do what I've heard a little bit over here today, which is beginning to blame. There's been subtle messages of blaming families for failing the kids. There's been subtle messages of blaming social services as well. So that, that's the game we end up in because we all have good intentions, but we keep realizing if, if you don't play the way I want you to play, then you must be the problem. And that's not it. Because many times, all these professionals coming into one kid's life is the problem. Because we're coming in it through our own lens, we're making that kid tell the same story over and over again, we're re-traumatizing them, we're keeping them further and further from their family. So moving forward, I like to see us shift our culture to working more integratively, letting go of some of our individual position power, and really trying to say who's going to really take the lead here, how do we orchestrate this for this child, and also how do we also reach out to the family at the exact same time. So while the child is in Arizona, who's working with the family here to get them ready for that reunification there? How do we work? As soon as we identify a kid, we should be identifying a family and resources should be in there to help them with their health and healing and their readiness to help their child. Thank you. While Carol walks that over to Stacy, I know we didn't get to all the questions. I have some in my pocket. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, you know, we will have the opportunity to continue this conversation outside of this room and email me questions and we'll make sure that they get addressed. But I'm going to let Stacy make her closing remarks now. Seeing if this is on. Um, I think I'm going to do... Uh, Everybody favor and close by saying I want to thank everybody who came today. Uh, I want to thank our panelists who spoke with just unbelievable candor and um, knew there were going to be divergent opinions and unresolved answers. Um, you guys were awesome, really. And we're, for us, we just we really wanted to sponsor a conversation today that was just like what happened. So. I am so appreciative of everybody's time, and I know we ran over, and everybody is probably hungry. We have lunch. Um, and last, I want to thank Carol, who did this so much justice by trying to weave through 20-odd pages of a narrative and keep all the things in motion. Um, thank you. There is also a website, I think on our website is um, an email. It's in your packet for next steps, thoughts, closing, um, more questions. We'll try to get them answered and um, figure out what part two is. But that was the point of today. Thank you so much.